Hello. Thank you for joining us for this program on transformational leadership in a turbulent time, sponsored by the Transformational Leadership in Church and Society program at Yale Divinity School. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Elijah Hayward, a 2007 alum of YDS, who's now the Chief Operating Officer of the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. Dr. Hayward also holds a PhD in American Studies from UNC Chapel Hill. He will be interviewed by YDS student Jonathan Lee, a second year Master of Divinity degree student who's in the ordination process with the Presbyterian Church. This five-part series will air a new episode every Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. Let me tell you a bit about the rest of the program. On October 25th, our guest will be Ashley McCarr, a YDS alum, writer, and the community liaison person working with Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services in New Haven. On November 1st, we will welcome Ben Groth, a YDS alum who's a Lutheran pastor in New Orleans and a PhD student in history at Tulane, studying the relationship between white supremacy and Christianity in early America. November 8th, our guest will be Father Ryan Lerner, a Roman Catholic priest who's the chaplain at St. Thomas More Parish at Yale and Chancellor of the Archbishop Archdiocese of Hartford. Finally, on November 15th, our guest will be Bishop William P. Barber, President of Repairers of the Breach and Co-Chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We hope that you'll find this series on transformational leadership in a turbulent time to be both helpful and thought-provoking. Now we turn to Dr. Elijah Hayward and Jonathan Lee. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us for Yale Divinity School's Transformational Leadership in a Turbulent Time video conversation. My name is Jonathan Lee. I am a second year MDiv student from Charlotte, North Carolina. Today, we will hear from Elijah Hayward, MAR class of 2007. Born in Beaufort, South Carolina, Elijah made his way to YDS via Hampton University and recently earned his PhD in American Studies from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Elijah's work and re research interests lie at the intersection of African American history, pop culture, art, education, and religion. In 2018, Elijah was a member of the YDS task force responsible for the commission of the oil portrait of James Pennington, the first black student to attend classes at Yale, which is now prominently on display in the YDS common room. A lifetime promoter of the arts as a vehicle for representation, Elijah returned to the South Carolina Low Country in 2018, where he now serves as the Chief Operating Officer for the International African American Museum in Charleston, currently slated for a 2022 opening. Elijah, thank you so much for joining us today. Jonathan, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, of course. So I just want to start off our conversation um, a little, with a little bit about your work currently uh, with the International African American Museum. Um, as a Southerner myself, it, I was really excited to hear that such a project was going on. Um, I have a bunch of memories of traveling down to Charleston, um, spending time in the historic districts, doing service projects around the place in Johns Island, um, but always thinking that there is something else that I could be doing here something that could like something to do that had more to do with the history of Charleston, um, especially for its African American community. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the museum, um, especially what it means for you as a Southerner, as a local of the area? Of course, but I just want to begin by just saying how excited I am to be a part of this series. Um, it's an amazing opportunity, I think, for alums and folks beyond the YDS community to really engage in meaningful discourse. So I'm really excited that we have some time together. Uh, so thank you again. Um, you know, I'm from South Carolina. I'm from the Low Country as well. And there's something really special about our part of the country. In particular, there's a really strong significance to the African American community in the sense that Charleston was the single greatest point of entry for African captives during the slave trade. So the idea that we have about half of all enslaved Africans passing through Charleston means that, well, at least we argue that every African-American can trace at least one relative to, to, to Charleston, which makes our institution pretty significant thinking, in thinking about American culture and history in general, particularly for the African-American experience. Professor Henry Louis Gates says that we are ground zero for black history. And that's something that we take very, very seriously. 
Um, you know, Charleston, as you know, is a really amazing city. It's been voted the number one city in the world by travel and leisure several times over. But there's a way in which that narrative uh, really hasn't fully expanded upon the whole notion of the African-American experience and the way in which we hope to do it through our institution. So in sum, our museum's mission is to share untold stories of, or actually to honor the untold stories of the African-American journey at one of our nation's most sacred sites. That site is the former Gaston's Wharf, that point of entry that I was talking about, but also it's a place where not only, you know, many of our ancestors first arrived, it's a place where a lot of, a lot of things happen from, you know, death um, to the historical idea of being able to see Fort Sumter from our site, the location, well, I guess the place where the Civil War started, to also Sullivan's Island, the point of quarantine for slave ships doing the trade as well. So our museum honors this very expansive legacy, one that began in West Africa, had a touch point in America in Charleston, and went on to impact the world. So we have a museum itself. We have a Center for Family History, which will be a preeminent research institution uh, for all Americans, with a particular focus on the African-American experience. And we have an Ancestors uh, Memorial Garden uh, designed by landscape architect Walter Hood, which is a place for contemplation to honor uh, so much of this experience that we're really excited to preserve. So, you know, I think that's a really amazing opportunity, particularly during this moment in history, to be able to look back, but also use our lessons from the past to look forward. Wow, that's awesome. So could you tell us a bit about like how you found yourself at the museum? Like what skills were you able to cultivate, um, you know, during your time maybe at YDS or during your PhD studies that, you know, when the museum was looking for someone to be in charge, they thought, hey, this Elijah guy, this guy, he has the skills that we need. You know, that's, that's a great question, Jonathan. Um, you know, it's really great to have an opportunity to talk uh, about my faith in a way that I feel like the, the community can really connect with. Um, I'm a person of faith, and I always love the quote by Martin Luther King Jr. that, you know, faith is taking the first step, believing that God will build the staircase. And to me, I've lived my life driven by faith and passion. So I've always pursued things that I felt like were of meaning that would lead to an opportunity to be of service. Because to me, my life is committed to serving God and God's people. And I believe that there's a way that we can embark on a journey to really explore what that looks like, allowing for, you know, opportunities to unfold as their will. So for me, you know, I was a history major at Hampton University. Um, I was really, really excited about, you know, the idea of uh, archives and libraries and research. It's been a, 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 lot, a lifetime, you know, love affair for me. You know, I was raised in libraries, raised in museums, and really always interested in understanding how the past could impact our present, particularly through movements like the Civil Rights Movement, understanding the law and all the ways in which these uh, thinkers were able to mobilize people and communities in a meaningful way. So I think that that, 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 that focus on history is, is something that's always abided with me. And uh, coming to Yale Divinity School was, bit, was a bit of a fluke because I don't think I ever considered myself uh, attending Divinity School. Um, I think in college, I considered it might be something I would pursue, you know, when I retired. As a, as a fun thing to kind of uh, embark upon. But um, I, I felt called to, to attend Divinity School in, in, in college. I came to YDS and I don't know if I fully appreciated what I was getting into, but what I walked away with was a greater understanding of my purpose, um, a framework for what I like to call public social witness and understanding about how our faith can be something that can be applied to any industry that we encounter. Um, you know, during my first semester, I was really, really conflicted because in my mind, I felt like I was pigeonholed into becoming a pastor, something that I think is very admirable um, and, and a worthy endeavor. But at the time, it didn't really feel like a real fit. So I really needed the language and the context for understanding the greater contribution of individuals who had a, a theological background. So I'll never forget there was this New York Times front page article talking about, you know, theological education in the Vanity Schools people who had uh, attended and what they were doing. And I remember reading this article and sending it to everyone I knew because it felt like affirmation of the fact that this is an education that can be applied to any endeavor you have in life. I think that the grounding that I received at Yale Divinity School is really important because not only does it allow you to have a, uh, a framework for critical thinking or ethics 
or a greater understanding of, of approaches to problem solving. But I think it's important to have a grounding because in anything that we do, be you a pastor, a teacher, an entrepreneur, or you know, a CEO, you're going to need to have a grounding to come back to, a place to, to come to allow for you to have effective uh, problem solving and, and, uh, and uh, you know, an effective approach to, to thinking about challenges and decision making. You know, there needs to be something you come to to allow yourself to get still and to determine the next best step. So I think that the Divinity School experience for me offered me that grounding to come back to um, the, the, the ability to be a critical thinker, um, a foundation that has allowed me to be of service in various ways. And um, it's a journey that I, I say, I think I told Dean Sterling at one point that I use my Divinity School education every day because uh, an opportunity like this really calls upon all of the experiences I've had from fundraising to community organizing, to curating, to, to the scholarship, um, to really being able to make uh, really tough calls when it really counts. Right, sure. That, um, that really resonates with me because I, I guess similar to what you're saying, kind of came to Divinity School on a fluke myself, didn't, was caught at this crossroads of, um, should I go, should I like look for a full-time work, you know, and then coming here, should I be ordained? Should I not be ordained? Like what, what path do I, am I supposed to be taking? And so these words that, you know, it's not necessarily about taking this path towards ordination or there's no one right way to incorporate faith as long as you're doing it, as long as it is some, as long as you do hold on to that, um, theological education as a grounding. Um, so that makes me feel a lot better about <laughs> where I am and where I might be after I finish up at David's. I think it's such YDS. an important thing to remember. I'll never forget at graduation. Uh, Serene Jones was uh, one of the speakers and she described this toolkit. Mm. She said, you now have a toolkit. And the idea is that, you know, by virtue of this experience, you have all the resources that going through and graduating gives you to pull out what you need in a particular moment. And I would say that it's such, it's such a, uh, a tough experience when you're kind of at the beginning, right. figuring out, okay, where do I fit? How does this all work together? So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've been able to at least uh, get that for yourself as far as understanding that so much of faith is really walking, believing, and understanding that the path you're walking is one that's ordained for you. And that in this community of YDS, there's so many people and, and uh, from your peers, professors to staff, to really help to, to, to support that discernment process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I could, I want to ask you more about this idea of, of public social witness. So um, you, you mentioned it in your, in, you know, what you're just saying, but I feel like I've also seen it in some other interviews that you have on online as I was doing some research on you. So um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, just yeah, for sure. I, I, that I, just, idea. I just started the fact that, you know, my heroes growing up were the community organizers for my community. Um, Gullah, Geechee men and women who may have gone off to college but came back to be of service and leveraged their skills and talents to be a benefit to the community that we came from. And so I was always enamored with the, the idea that there is a calling mm -hmm. or greater purpose and service that we have to humanity. It's something that my parents and grandparents um, instilled in me. It's something that I got in my, my church community on Coosaw Island in Beaufort, South Carolina. It's something that always, uh, that always respected about the civil rights movement. The fact that you have this broad coalition of people, um, you know, mostly African-Americans who are organizing in churches and mosques in different places to really think about how we can critically approach change in a way that have a lasting impact, an impact that we're both benefiting from today. So to me, that's a very public thing. It's there's an inward journey that Howard Thurman talks about that we kind of work on in ourselves, but there's an outward manifestation of that that I think is really beautiful when we have the opportunity to fully allow it to take its course. So I think that the forming that happened for me at Yale Divinity School was very internal at, at thinking through ideas and approaches learning from frameworks from the past, you know, those inspired by the Bible, but also those inspired by those who took, you know, the Bible and its teachings to an act in a particular way. That could be through artistic expression, through theater, through music, through art. It could be through scholarship, but there are all these ways in which the public space, the public uh, sphere is, is, a, is a really great opportunity 
And for me, as someone that wasn't, you know, really destined to be a pastor at the time, I was thinking that how do I fit in? You know, what, what is it that I uh, have to contribute to such a worthy endeavor of inspiring people through the hope of Christ and through faith? And uh, for me, it's like, okay, well, you know, we have the folks that are coming to church pretty much confirmed in a sense. They're in the body of faith. But what is there left for those individuals who would never set foot in a place of worship? And I want to extend that to our synagogues, our temples, our mosques, you know, our, our anywhere people feel connection to a higher being. And so for me, I was really fascinated by the way in which the arts, activism, social justice, institutions all play a role in inspiring hope in a particular way. I was never really an evangelist, someone that wanted to go out with my Bible and, you know, try to, you know, convince people uh, to, to serve God and follow Christ in a very outward way. But to me, there's a way in which we can be a part of an interfaith dialogue that inspires hope through connection and through meeting people where they are in their journey. And so, you know, through the arts, through institutions, through scholarship, through activism, there are, these are all ways in which there's a public witness that we have. You know, in many instances, we know that this witness is inspired by someone's faith and, and beliefs and practices. But in many instances, we have no idea what's really grounding that. And I think that's really cool because it all achieves the same end. So I really uh, benefited from the opportunity at YDS to have, you know, exchanges with people from all walks of life that were, that were able to inform me on my journey. Um, you know, it could have been uh, the class I took at the business school uh, that put, you know, divinity school students in conversation with business school students, in conversation with CEOs who spoke off the record about how their faith did or did not inform their leadership style. Or, you know, my, my colleagues at the, 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 the School of Drama that we collaborate with on plays to really get at a particular end of thinking about cultural identity and how our identities have an impact on how we see ourselves in a greater context. Of, of the society that we're living to living in and want to contribute to. So I think that, you know, the world beyond our, our church walls seemed to be uh, uh, something that felt right for me. And at the time, um, the tagline for Yale Divinity School was uh, preparing leaders for church and world. And I love the whole world part because there's a huge opportunity out there to be of service. And to me, that's what, that's what led me to Yale Divinity School that curiosity about how to be of service, of how to leverage scholarship in a way that could really impact the world. Um, but also, um, I'm also someone that's really interested in connecting with people and learning because to me, we have far more to gain from our neighbors uh, in being in communication and learning about difference than we do by staying you know, in silos where we don't have that opportunity to connect. I mean, I. I love how you're talking about the different schools and taking classes um, with, you know, different groups of people. I think that's definitely been a struggle for me. Um, uh, what is it? Going down the hill or like going downtown. Yeah, downtown. As we say. Where's downtown everyone's talking about. Right, exactly. Uh, New York City. <laughs> um, but, but, but that's the greatest gift is that, you know, Yale Divinity School is part of a larger environment. And it's my value that all students have the opportunity to allow for our YDS experience to be influenced in a positive way by these interactions. So, um, you know, may not be taking a class, but, but I think there's a great opportunity to be, be a part of conversations and discourses that can really inform your own ministerial practice, your own vocation, and the formation that happens up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all wonderful. I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, I can see behind you, you have a wonderful little shelf of different artwork. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's a little um, little headshot of the Pennington portrait above you. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about your experience with the arts. Um, what has, how has that been a factor in your life? You mentioned stuff with the um, School of Drama. Um, did you you had done plays or is that what, like, what was that experience like? How, how is the arts all a part how, of this? How, how much time do you have? Here? <laughs> we can keep talking. You know, the, the, what, what's amazing about Yale Divinity School is that I decided to attend because of the Institute, the Institute for Sacred Music. Hmm. I was really impressed by the fact that the arts were a major pillar in the theological education experience at Yale 
And that felt very unique, very important to me, and a really nice way to not only get rid of reprieve, but also to expand this whole idea of public witness that was a really big part of my life. Um, I am a, uh, I've, been, I've been doing theater since I've been a kid. Um, I've been doing art since I've been a kid. I've studied voice. Um, I have studied movement. Um, I, I had the opportunity to work with Kathleen Turner, Reverend Dr. Kathleen Turner at Yale Divinity School, who choreographed a play that, mm. Meredith Coleman Tobias, Dr. Meredith Coleman Tobias and I wrote when we were students there. And there's just a way in which I think that, that the immersive experience of life is, uh, is, uh, is made all the more better or beneficial by engaging all of our senses. And considering how we fully embody the service that we want to be a part of in the greater, in the greater context, through writing, through connection, conversation, through the arts. So I want to just give my parents credit because they allowed for me to have the full exploration of that as a, as a kid. And that sparked things that, that remain important to me. And right now, I think the best way of describing that manifestation is through my interest and commitment to preserving, and promoting uh, African-American culture and arts in a particular way. So, um, you know, that's through documenting photography, uh, that's through, you know, engaging in conversation with emerging artists and helping to support their, their, uh, the promotion of their work. Um, and that's through institution building, you know, through the museum. Um, but it's hard to kind of think about where this started, but I'll just say that, you know, my parents' early influence was key. The cultural outputs that really helped to frame my identity as an African-American man were all created by my parents. So it's the TV shows we watch, you know, uh, you know, uh, it was the, the movies that they put before me. It was the art in our household. It was my grandfather who was an artisan. Um, you know, it was the idea of learning that there are many ways that we can express ourselves and share ideas. So the appreciation of, of that, but also the understanding that I can be a part of that endeavor has really been something that's really been important to me. And I think that as people of color in a nation that's still wrestling with, with uh, equity, and representation, you know, Sarah Lewis, professor at Harvard, talks about representational justice and this idea that there is a really important discourse around justice that shows up in the arts in a particular way. I think that one of the great examples of that is Frederick Douglass. You know, he was the most photographed man of the 19th century. Photography at the time was a new um, innovation. He leveraged that innovation to not only document himself in his life, but to think about how this could be a justice act to allow for generations <laughs> to come to not only have a glimpse on who he was, of who he was, but for his, co his contemporaries to see his personhood in a really real way that you cannot deny. So, you know, he was an early uh, arbiter of this Instagram, you know, phase we're kind of living in today. But to me, that really fascinates me about how we can shift the perception of, of minor, minority groups, of uh, people of color, of marginalized people in general, through sharing stories and ideas through art, uh, through, through narratives, through theater, uh, dance, all the above. And I think that my life has been enriched by the artists that have allowed for me to be in, in community with them. And I am really committed to doing my part to not only preserve this tradition from our past, but to continue to create a pathway forward in the future. Mm. That's that's really heartening to hear, especially because I feel like, um, you know, especially you're, you're mentioning photography that we're almost becoming desensitized to the photography because we have the little boxes in our in our pockets that we can use to take photos of everything. Like they, the photos have almost lost meaning in a sense. But you're saying that it's it's there still is so much meaning and power behind w the art and images that we choose to capture and share. I think so, because, I mean, I think we're all curating our lives, you know, for public consumption, for better, for worse. Mm -hmm. um, the same way that Douglas when it was curating a, an act of justice, you and I do it every day with Instagram and what we choose to uh, share, uh, the type of uh, posts, the type of images of ourselves that we put out there and the messaging around it. Um, so I think that that's a platform that we really should take seriously and a really powerful, uh, as a powerful um, intervention that can really make a big impact. I mean, of course, it's fun. We should definitely lean into it. But I think that the justice work that we uh, see having such an impact today 
has different levels. Um, and I think that it's really powerful to consider how in the past it was leveraged uh, to be a, a, of a particular impact. Mm. Well, speaking of Instagram, um, for our viewers, um, Elijah gave me a wonderful access into his own Instagram feed. Um, and I've, you know, pulled out some photos and I was wondering if you could just tell us a little story about, you know, the thought process of, of exactly what you're talking about, curating your, your social media feed and stuff like that. So I'm just going to like, uh, let me, let me get this is the first Jonathan. This is, this is going to be fun. Uh, and for the viewers, we're going to, um, we'll, kind of put the the shot up so that you can see them um this is a fun little game just describing the photo to you and see if you can get it so um one that i really enjoyed you posted this recently it was hashtagged uh, grandma's hands and you have oh, yeah. you know, a woman's yeah, hand yeah. in the corner this old newspaper in front of you this kind of so uh, it's, it's yeah. interesting it's interesting because um in, in some of my talks i, I talk about my great grandmother being uh, one of the most important curators of my life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea of uh, going to her house and how she chose to curate her living room, which is always a sacred space in most mm -hmm. other homes. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the wall being covered with photos and looking for my picture, finding my picture and feeling a sense of belonging and that being synonymous to how I think we should approach institution building through, through the ways in which we, we, we uh, promote belonging in a particular way. And uh, my grandmother is an archivist. She has an archive of newspaper clippings, of, of uh, obituaries, of, of church programs, of anything relevant to our family story. And uh, she recently turned 80, and I've been quarantining to be able to spend time with her. So we had a uh, parade for her on the island that, you know, I, I grew up on. And, uh, you know, we spent time, you know, around the family table, uh, food is always a, a place, uh, uh, I'm sorry, food is always an object of connection for family. And uh, we're talking about a particular narrative germane to our community. And she had a clipping to kind of, uh, you know, share that particular historic moment for a family that we all know, knew very well. So I was just moved by the, her hands in relation to the clipping, uh, the adornment of her table and her, her curation of that, that whole piece. And just... The idea of uh, Bill Withers' song, Grandma's Hands, this felt like a really appropriate connection in that moment. Yeah, I love the photo. I mean, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents there, also in um, the Charlotte area, and I grew oh, up going to their house. And like, yeah, there's all these old photos of, of, of me and my cousins that are still just like hanging around. Um, and I especially love how it's that, uh, that linoleum tablecloth that's kind of faded in certain spots because it's, it's like either, you know, so many people have eaten on it or it's just like old and like poor quality kind of thing. So I love the, I love the, there's, the personal there's touch there. how we adorn our homes. And yeah. I think that uh, there's a story there that has uh, deep roots and, mm -hmm. and it's very, uh, just very important to, to capture. So to me, I'm always thinking about how do I document this moment for the future? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a great example of that. All right, so we'll go to the next image. I, I love it. It's like, it's like we're playing a little game here. Um, <laughs> all right, so this one is um, from July. It's, it's a portrait of a family. Um, they have, there's sunflowers on the edge. Uh, it's kind of framed as if it's a postcard. There's a stamp in the corner. Yeah, you know, that, that, I, I, I love Instagram because to me, Instagram is all about um, a particular conversation mm -hmm. that happens uh, visually. And um, I spend a great deal of time just, just really taking in images from artists. And uh, I, I happened upon this, this account and it was really taken by the color in the piece, the composition, um, the contemporary approach to, uh, to family um, and the whole idea of how I think, I think there's a, there's a quote and forgive me, I don't know who said it, but the quote is art makes, makes us feel less alone. Mm. And to me, um, when art is done well, be it a song, be it a play, be it a dance piece, you feel a connection, you see yourself. And I saw myself in the piece uh, through the depiction of family. And, uh, um, you know, my, my Instagram feed is really about sparking conversation, but more so, you know, leveraging an opportunity to kind of uh, have a, a diary of sorts that, that can be shared for my benefit, but for public consumption. So that the piece really connected with me in that particular way. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, 
the next one, it's, this, is, um, this is a photo, I believe it might be a photo that you took yourself, but it's a, a woman, wonderful blue dress, big orange um, hairpiece, a hat kind of thing um, in front oh. of the church altar. Yeah, um, so that, that was a very important moment. Um, Miss White is a, a local griot. Uh, she's of Gullah Geechee descent. And she was a participant in the worship service for our museum's groundbreaking that happened about a year ago this month. So to me, um, the opportunity to document a very historic moment of a community elder um, being so, so prominently displayed um, on our program was really important to me. But it's also important because uh, we were in Mother Emanuel, um, the, the, the location of the massacre in 2015. And I think that um, just the, the power of place, uh, the composition of Miss White and her adornment, you know, it's almost as if she's a queen. And she is a queen. <laughs> but, you know, the, the regality mm-hmm. of, of, of her head, head, headdress, her, uh, her dress itself, um, the same glass behind her, mm-hmm. uh, which depicts a particular narrative in itself, um, and then the, the, the prominence of, of, of her stature in our community and the institution of, of, of Mother Emanuel Amy Church itself just felt like it just was too perfect not to capture. So, so that was a shot that I took. I'm really, really proud of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, preserving these moments is, is really what Instagram is all about, isn't it? It's these it like little, these, these snapshots of what, what we're experiencing so we can share for others. <laughs> um, so this other one, I, I wish this was a video because I feel like there was, it must have been an amazing experience, but it's um, a black and white portrait of a man um, with, uh, with a banjo on his lap um, yeah. with these yeah. overall, or these, uh, you know, the um, suspenders um, around. You really, you really, you really, you really went back. Uh, that's, <laughs> uh, maybe about like. You gave me access. Thanks for, thanks for uh, your interest in, 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 in appreciating and enjoying it. So that, that's a member of the, the Carolina Chalka Drops. Um, as you likely know, um, the, whole, the whole landscape of bluegrass music is not very diverse, but there's a group uh, that includes Rihanna Giddens and uh, the gentleman pictured in, in, the, uh, in the shot, um, a trio from Chapel Hill actually, that you know, formed uh, this band and have really done their part to preserve and promote a particular tradition that dates back to Africa. You know, the banjo is an instrument that Africans, uh, you know, created and brought to America. And I'm not sure if it's ever fully been um, honored in that way. So this reclaiming of this musical tradition, I think, is really important as a Southern um, output, but also as one that connects us to the, to the diaspora in a particular way. So I had the opportunity to, uh, to TA a, a course for Professor Bill Ferris at UNC on Southern music. And uh, he brought in uh, several performers uh, during the course of the experience. And on that particular day, we had an audience with this amazing musician. And, uh, you know, being able to have the frame to, to catch a shot and to benefit from uh, this, this uh, oral tradition that he, he was leveraging in the moment was really, really exciting. Yeah. And like I said, I wish there was a video, but sometimes you, you can't be recording. You just have to sit there and just soak everything up. Yeah, being present is really important, for sure. Right, right. All right, uh, we'll do um, one more. I guess this is the last one. This is, um, this I think is, this is a very powerful image and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a picture of you with a quilt uh, <laughs> with all the different patchworks. Um, you know, it's funny, I actually have the quilt uh, here. Um, I'm not yep. gonna go get it. <laughs> so it, this, it's interesting because uh, I consider myself to be an artist and mm-hmm. producer. And um, in thinking about my dissertation defense, I wanted to make it an immersive experience. So I curated a photography show um, that, that essentially featured my documented photography of uh, the Gullah Geechee region, um, which is one of the focuses of my research. So I had the photography show um, that was presented, but I also wanted to make a backdrop for myself as I stood before the audience, you know, make, in, in, in during my defense. So I... Uh, I had the idea to commission a quote by my grandmother, mm. who's a quote maker, a tradition that, you know, was brought to prominence by the G's Ben quilters, but also one that's really germane to the African-American experience in a particular way, um, you know, ties us to the Underground Railroad, but more importantly, ties us to the intentionality of uh, the functionality, we'll say, of warmth, 
but also the intentionality of how narratives can be preserved through storytelling. So you have, you know, strips of clothing, you have, you know, maybe an old curtain or a handkerchief all coming together that reminds the viewer or the person that's able to engage with the quilt of this long history that they're a part of. So I wanted to honor that tradition, but I wanted to do it in a meaningful way. So I reached out to everyone who has had any role in my life um, from childhood to today. My mom was really helpful in, in organizing the, the, the outreach and asked them to donate an object of, of an article of clothing. So I got uh, handkerchiefs, I got uh, dresses, uh, we received um, fabric that folks went and bought out because it reminded them of me in a particular way or the narratives in which I, I sought to preserve. And what we got is this amazing quilt that you see that honors where I come from. Because for me, I have not achieved anything in life or made it to this point without the community that supports me, that's been praying for me. Um, a great example of that is that the day of my dissertation, right before I was about to uh, present, I was stressed, I was running around. And I saw, um, and I was outside in the hallway, kind of taking a moment uh, to catch my breath. And I saw this line of people walking towards me. And it was, you know, led by my god sister, you know, my family, my community that come from, from Buford and around the country to, to uh, support me. And they, they formed a circle. And they said, we're here to pray. And I said, what? They said, we're here to pray. And, and I said, uh, right here? It, because for me, I'm, a very, I'm very private about my faith. Um, but they formed a prayer circle in the hallway uh, in front of the room. Uh, where my defense was happening. And that has to be one of the most uh, important and powerful moments of my life because it reminded me of uh, the fact that for all of us, we're surrounded by people who are praying for us uh, in ways in which we know we don't know. But it reminded me too, going back to the notion of grounding that in our moments of deepest stress and anxiety, we have something to come back to. And it takes sometimes the people that know us the best to remind us of that, that community. So the quote, is a visual representation of this community that's got me to this point. And uh, I think that I'm just really proud to have this art piece that I commissioned come together so well. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. I've, I have to ask though, do you, is, do you use the quilt like as like a blanket or is it just kind of on the wall for you to see? It's actually in storage in it's a sense. <laughs> I have it packed away. Um, you know, I think that one day I want to hang it up. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it's just one of these sacred, secret pieces that mm. I want to do my best to preserve for the rest right. of my life. And actually our conversation, Jonathan, uh, prompted me to pull it out and look at it again. And it really, um, it's a very, it's a very moving experience mm. to kind of look at the quilt and to look at all the love mm. that went into that. I mean, that, that's one thing I have to, I can't say enough is that I've been blessed to be surrounded by love for my entire life and to have a lot of people who have loved and supported me to this moment. And I think that's one of the things that um, inspires the work that I do, because I think that having such a privilege has uh, empowered me to want to show up in the world in, in a particular way and hopefully offer that to, to, to as many people as possible. That's, that's amazing. Um, I was wondering if we could, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about the process with the Pennington portrait, as far as... Um, I feel like it ties so well in with this idea that you mentioned representational justice. Um, yeah, can you tell us a bit yeah. about that process, about what it was like being on that commission um, and finally yeah, having well, that. Well, again, we, I have to acknowledge the work of Dean Sterling in, in, in uh, creating um, space at Yale Divinity School for diversity. Since he arrived, it was something that he was very uh, clear about being a priority of his. It's been amazing to see that take shape on, the, on various levels. Um, and I think that, you know, from Dean Sterling to the faculty, to the board, it's been a collaborative effort that I've been very uh, fortunate to be a part of. Um, I just remember my first visit to Yale Divinity School. I actually came with my, uh, my best friend, Stephen Chambers, who went to Harvard Divinity School. <laughs> and I'll never forget, um, Jan Fournier, I'm giving us a tour and going to the common room. And I was just so, uh, I was so amazed by the room because... Um, you know, I've always, I wanted to be an architect when I was a kid, mm -hmm. so I was always enamored by structures and uh, the in, in, interiority of space. And uh, I remember just looking around and seeing these massive portraits 
and being struck by the artistry, wondering who the individuals were and feeling a sense of respect uh, for whatever they accomplished to allow them to be, you know, so prominently displayed. But I also remember looking for myself <laughs> and feeling a bit um, kind of disconnected from the institution by virtue of the lack of diversity on the walls. And so I kind of had a silent, you know, uh, hope in my heart to say, you know, it'd be cool to be a part of diversifying this space one day. Um, you know, those silent prayers are the ones that I think God honors because um, it, was a, it, was a, it was definitely a, a, uh, a great gift to be invited to be a part of the commission and to be able to introduce Jazz Knight to the committee for consideration. Jazz is an amazing artist. He's someone that I, I, I've met on Instagram and uh, we became friends and I became a, a really big champion for his work because Jazz's work is really about shifting the way in which we see blackness. Uh, there's a way in which the quotidian um, nature of blackness is, is at times taken for granted because in many ways, stereotypes become the dominant narrative that shift the way in which we see people who are different. I think this can, can you know, uh, go to the ways in which we see uh, the death of unarmed black men and women by virtue of the, the, the perception of them being um, somehow, um, you know, uh, somehow uh, a, uh, because of the perception that they are somehow, um, you know, dangerous. Um, and I think it's a perception that we've been fighting against as a, as a society, you know, from slavery, thinking about the amazing period of, of uh, emancipation, reconstruction, the strides, the representation that happened there in Congress and through institution building. To have that only taken away through Jim Crow, segregation, black codes, you know, all these things that question personhood and equality in a particular way and how representation and how we showed up became a way that, you know, the activism could take a particular form of shape through the arts. But Jazz's work is a contemporary take on that to say that, you know, the everyday act of being black is something that should not have to be announced should not have to be um, essentialized, it's just enough as it is. And so uh, his style seemed to be the perfect consideration for the portrait for James, of James Pennington. And I am really honored that you know, we were all able to align in a way to support what I think is an amazing testament to our institution that now hangs in the common room. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Um, I remember going to the common room myself and being, and I've had, I've taken, I've loved um, art history courses and, you know, being able to see history within paintings and kind yeah. of reflect yeah. on what are the various forces that come together to make this painting. And I look around and then I land on that Pennington portrait and I'm like, this is different. There is an air to this that yeah. is, that is. I really appreciate that because I think that that was all intentional. Mm. Um, I think about Henry Tanner um, and the banjo lesson. My favorite painting is The Thankful Poor. Um, it's of a, an older gentleman and a younger young, young, young man, and they're praying um, over a meal that's pretty meager. And I've, I've always been struck by it because I think it reminds me to be grounded in gratitude despite our circumstances, but to also honor this tradition of mentorship of family, of legacy, um, and, uh, but I'm kind of, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a segue here. But Tanner, but Tanner was doing the, the active work of shifting the perception of black life during a period where there was a very, very, very strong um, view of who we were as, as a people. And I see that uh, Jazz's work in the, pain, the painting painting engages a particular narrative in the same way. Painting is standing, which I think is really important. Uh, he's adorned in, in the best clothing of his era to put him on equal footing of, of the other people who were displayed in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the common room. Um, his stature, his, his disposition, um, all of that speaks to a level of honor that is really, um, you know, that is really due to him given his life. And I believe that he married Frederick Douglass. I think, you know, he... He, he, was a, he was a pioneer in so many ways at Yale. And so much of my ability to attend Yale and be a part of the community is because of him. 
And I think that there's a way that honoring him in the way in which we did is so important to helping us to really create space for not only meaningful dialogue, but the importance of seeing a, a visibility for all people of, of difference uh, for moving forward. Yeah. So um, one last question that I have for you. Um, so like, like the video series said, this is transformational leadership in a turbulent yeah. time. And we yeah. cannot deny that this is a turbulent time that very we're turbulent in. Time. Very turbulent time. And by chaotic. the way, I just want to acknowledge, Jonathan, I understand that, uh, that for you and your classmates, this is a really, really tricky moment, you know, having online courses, not being able to fully engage in communities. So I just want to acknowledge and honor how hard it must be mm. and that, you know, you and the community are definitely my thoughts and prayers as we all navigate this really, really, really challenging moment in our history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> and you off, but I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> no worries. No worries. It's, um, but yeah, I just wanted to ask, so in, in this turbulent time, what is, has been a glimmer of hope for you? What is something for you to look forward to um, and give you some, some kind of peace? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, you know, our institution has been in the works, I, I like to say for generations, because it honors our ancestors and honors a part of our, of our history, a collective history as Americans that has not fully been interrogated in a meaningful way. Um, but it's been a 20 year project. And the fact that we are about two years away from opening is really um, profound to me because this is not possible if about the thousands of people who've contributed money, resources, time, hopes, dreams, and projected upon this, this structure that we're building that honors a really meaningful um, part of our history. So I am inspired every day by having the privilege of working with an amazing team of colleagues, an amazing board, an amazing community to make the vision for the International African American Museum a reality. And that would not be possible without a grounding in my faith the greater understanding of how we all have, a, have the power and ability to make a difference. I have to acknowledge though, that this is a really challenging time and I've been really um, heartened by conversations with YDS colleagues who are on the front lines, I like to say, mm -hmm. as pastors, as chaplains, as people who are serving um, in a really direct way. And I think that, you know, the social isolation, the disconnection from family, the, the idea that when we do have to grieve, we have to grieve in isolation and deal with, you know, several um, components of mental health and health in general, the disparities that exist, people who have limited resources, all of these things are weights that I think uh, we all wrestle with. So I, I humbly, uh, you know, pray for our world and pray for that we all are able to just maintain a sense of peace. And for me, um, to answer your question directly, beyond the, the uh, mission that, that, we're, that we're making reality, I've really been uh, gratified by the renewal of relationships. Mm. Um, I have the, the blessing of having the chance to go and celebrate my grandmother's 80th birthday with my, my family and community in a very safe way. Um, I have the blessing of having friends that I've been able to reconnect with because despite where we are globally, we're all dealing with the same thing. So being able to have a conversation with my friend, uh, Marquise, who lives in South Africa, and uh, have him be able to relate in the same way in which I can relate to my friends who are in New York or California or anywhere else is really uh, amazing because it reminds me that despite all of the things that we have around us, um, that may be distractions, the things that really matter are relationships. You know, hopefully a relationship with ourselves, relationship with a higher power or whatever we, we, we engage to make sense of the world, but also a relationship with loved ones and community that we can remind ourselves that we're not in this alone, that we have each other. And for me, that has been the thing that has offered a sense of hope. And I'll say that that reflects my Yale Divinity School experience because as a student, and even since leaving, it's been very apparent to me that I have been, I benefited from being a part of a community of people who I feel um, are co-laborers in this whole enterprise of service and justice. And to me, that makes me feel very, very happy and excited about what the future holds. Thank you. Well, that's definitely, I, I agree with that. I mean, or I, I share that feeling. I, I loved, 
you know, as much as it was hard being home for the past, you know, and being away from school, especially as the spring semester was wrapping up, it was uh, wonderful to be back at home, to be with my parents and to re um, rekindle those relationships um, during this pandemic and during this crazy time. So I definitely, um, uh, yeah, you know, I, identify I, I, with that. And it's really good to hear that, Jonathan, because I know that, uh, you know, the idea of being home after being away is never easy. Um, but I'm an optimist, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And to me, it has been hard some days to kind of have that, have that, have that mm -hmm. approach. But, you know, despite what's going on, and there's a lot going on, um, it's really good that, to hear that for you in particular, you're able to see the upside. Because I think that, you know, being intentional about honoring what is good, what's positive, um, is going to really be the thing that helps us to make it through. And we will get through. That's the one thing that our faith shows us is that no matter your tradition, the, there is a, uh, we know the conclusion, you know, we know how this is going to end. It's going to end for good and for the better. We just want to hope and pray that we all remain healthy and safe and can support each other until we get there. Well, Elijah, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I have nothing else to add. If, if there's anything else you want to um, last, any, any parting thoughts you want to share with the YDS community? Um, you know, about, you know? <laughs> I would say just gratitude. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm really uh, grateful for my Yale Divinity School experience. I would not be in, here in this moment without it. Um, you know, I use my education every single day. It shifted the way in which I engage the world and my family and my loved ones in service. And I would say that there's so many opportunities for students to really make an impact. I was, uh, I was um, honored to be able to be a Yale President's Public Service Fellow, which mm -hmm. allowed me to launch a nationwide college access program, the Youth Scholar Academy that served young people from across the country. And to me, that's just one example of how you know, as a student, you can really leverage the resources of the institution to benefit your path in a meaningful way. So I want to just, you know, extend my um, my support to any uh, anyone out there that may see a benefit in my journey. And uh, just to you, Jonathan, I just want to say you really have been a, a great conversation partner. But beyond that, I'm really excited about you and your future. And I'm grateful for you allowing me to have this opportunity to share a little bit of my journey. It's, it, 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 and it is a journey that's still unfolding, by the way. But I, I'm honored just to have this opportunity. So thank you again. Yes, thank you so much. I'm honored to have spoken, be able to learn your story and be able to learn from you. Um, honored to be able to have access to your Instagram and get to see all that, the wonderful way you've been curating your, <laughs> you that virtual like Fort space. Knox, what? <laughs> make my Instagram sound like it's Fort Knox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, and I can't wait to, um, to visit the museum in 2022 and everything opens up and everything. I look, I look forward to hosting you. I'll let you know when I'm, when I'm by. <laughs> please do, please do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Elijah. Um, and thank you so much to our viewers for watching this conversation. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.